Good evening and welcome to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table. Tonight, we are doing lithium. I hope you all got your collectible card out there. Did everyone get a card? It should be on your chair. I want to see, take a little poll here. How many people here also have the helium card? which was last month. There's one over there. How many people have the hydrogen card? You know, if you all come every month, you will eventually, after about 10 years, be able to build a complete periodic table of the elements using these cards. And there are instructions on the back as to which way you go for the various elements. So you should come to all of our periodic table, our Everything Matters presentation. By the way, next month is going to be on the uh, uh, the 19th of March is going to be our next element. Anyone know what the next element is? Beryllium. Beryllium, yes. Element number four is next month. The month after that, we're going to take a little break because the Exploratorium's Gala is going to be occupying the space. But the month after that, we will continue on with Boron. So, and so on. Uh, now, uh, tonight, our subject, though, is lithium. Oh, well, let me one more up, one more, one more upcoming event as well, and that is on the uh, 26th, this coming Thursday and Sunday, the next thir Thursday and Sunday. Uh, I invite you all to Full Spectrum Science, uh, which is going to be this time about radioactivity. We're going to move into the further end of the periodic table and talk about some of the elements way down there. So uh, if you're interested in radioactivity, we're going to do that at Full Spectrum Science this month. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about lithium, one of the things in the lighter end of the periodic table. Lithium, of course, is element number three. Uh, and you can see here it's way up at the top right-hand corner of the periodic table. Let's bring it out. There's lithium. Lithium is, uh, has three protons in its nucleus and various numbers of neutrons in, in the uh, nucleus as well. Uh, that's what makes it lithium. You have to count up the number of protons in the nucleus. It was originally discovered, well, actually was helped, the, the, the discovery was helped by this fellow right here, and I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly. Uh, he was a, a, a Brazilian scientist, Jose Bonifacio de Andrada e Silva, and uh, he uh, discovered uh, a mineral, he voyaged all over the world, and he discovered a mineral in 1800. Uh, he discovered this in Sweden, it's an, and he discovered it on an island called Uto in Sweden. Here's where that island is. Yeah, pretty cool. Very nice island. He discovered actually a few uh, interesting minerals there, all of which contained lithium. Uh, he brought it back with him. He called the element petalite. It's really uh, lithium aluminum silicate. And that he didn't know what to do with it. He did not, not discover lithium. He just discovered the element that contained lithium. But he gave it to this fellow, uh, Johann August Arfweden. Wedson, and uh, this is the fellow that actually took that element, powdered it up, and tried to find out what was in it. And uh, remember, it was lithium, uh, aluminum, and silicon. And he found that a portion of it was a metal that he didn't know what it was. He took this petalite, but he also took the other two elements that they found, uh, the other two minerals on the island, uh, spodamine and lepidolite. And with those, he was able to separate out this strange metal. Um, and he didn't know quite what it was. It was not what he was expecting. It wasn't like sodium or potassium that they already knew about. It was something new that acted like them. And he uh, named this element after the Greek word for stone because it was derived from stone as opposed to sodium, which was derived from seawater, from salts. Uh, the Greek word lithos, meaning stone. And what he got was this uh, metal, this light, shiny metal. And here's what it looks like, actually, if you see it in a, before it gets all tarnished. If you have it out in the air, it tarnishes. This sample is inside of a glass ampule, which is probably filled with inert gas like argon. Uh, you can also keep it in liquid, like uh, mineral oil. And here's uh, what it looks like floating in mineral oil. If you just have it out in the air, it actually can combine with nitrogen in the air, and it turns kind of black. Now, uh, if you look at the spectrum of this, we're going to look at, uh, in just a moment at uh, sort of how they do the spectrum. Uh, 
it has a lots of, a few lines in the visible part of the spectrum. And you notice there's that red line way over on the right-hand side of the, uh, of, the thing, of the chart there, of the, of the spectrum. That red line is what uh, you're, we're going to see in just a moment here. As a matter of fact, why don't we just do it? I have here, uh, let's see how you do a flame test. I have some regular table salt here. What is table salt? NaCl, sodium chloride. I'm going to take a little bit of this salt. I'm going to put it in this little dish right here. And I'm going to get a wire just a little bit wet so I can stick some salt to it. So I have a little bit of salt on this end of this wire. And I'm going to put that in a flame. And we're going to see the flame spectrum of sodium. And I have my able assistant here. Yes, she's going to put me out should I catch fire. Remember, pull the pin, <laughs> squeeze the handle, yes. aim, squeeze, and sweep. Remember that, okay. This fire marshal wants us to have that. Okay, so flame is pretty, pretty um, color free. It's a little blue, but if when I put the sodium in it, the sodium is gonna uh, get excited. The sodium atoms get excited and they're gonna give off light. So let's see what color light they give off. Any predictions? Anyone know what a sodium vapor lamp looks like? Here we go, let's look. There's something you can do at home, too. Beautiful yellow color, sodium. Yeah. Now, if you want to go see this in a lamp, go over to the exhibit that's over across the way there on the other side of the central gallery. Go to the monochromatic room. It puts out one color. Guess what that color is? It's a sodium lamp, yellow. So let's try lithium now. And I have, just as we have sodium chloride salt to do that, I have some lithium chloride salt. No, I don't know what it tastes like. <laughs> so I'm going to get a little water on that, and we'll put a, just get a little bit of lithium chloride. Lithium chloride absorbs water out of the air really well, so this you have to be you have to keep it dry. And it's actually that's one of its applications, which we'll get to. Okay, ready for this? I know you the proper, by the way. Proper etiquette is oohs and ahs. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Lithium. Oh, wait a minute. That had the sodium on it. Let's, <laughs> let's get lithium. Just lithium. I, I saw all that sodium light there. Let's, I used the wrong wire. Okay. Here we go. You got it. Oohs and ahs. That's good. Look at that beautiful crimson color. And that's that red line that you see in the spectrum there. So that's, isn't that cool? Okay. One, one more time. Okay. Here we go. You ready for ooh and ah? Okay. Melissa did not get that on her, her phone, so we're going to do it again. Here we go. Ready? Ooh. Ah. Now remember that color because that's going to be important when we get to some of the applications. Okay, I'm not going to make any more flames. I'm actually going to turn it to a safety position here. I'll even put it down here. Okay. So lithium comes in two forms in the, in the world. It comes as two different kinds of lithium, and they're called isotopes, or the same things of, same things, iso. And the, one of them has uh, three protons and three neutrons, that's lithium-6. The other one is three protons and four neutrons, that's lithium-7. But they're both lithium, they both chemically act exactly the same. Now, all lithium, most of the lithium, by the way, is lithium-7 in the world. Um, all the elements, that, including lithium-7, were made during the first 20 minutes after the Big Bang. And the only three elements that were made during the Big Bang, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. 75% of what was made after the Big Bang was hydrogen, 25% was lithium, and not very much uh, uh, helium, and not very much lithium. One atom per eight billion of hydrogen was uh, made during the Big Bang, but that's still the only three elements made during the Big Bang. Where does all the lithium come from now? Scientists believe that it's actually made in the shells of light, as opposed to heavy, stars. 
uh, and that at, when they end their lifetime <coughs> in a nova, that's the, uh, that produces the lithium. If lithium is inside of a heavier star, then the star tends to use the lithium and burns it as part of the fusion process. So you don't get lithium out of heavier stars, only light stars that burn it as part of the shell when they go nova and they throw the lithium out uh, into the universe and, and that becomes part of second generation stars. This was observed actually fairly recently in 2013, there was a nova in the constellation of Delphinus, and they uh, actually got to see the nova happen, and they could measure the lithium being produced in this nova. And so there you see a, a picture of the nova before the nova, during the nova, and a, higher, a longer exposure of the actual nova itself. This only reached barely visible to the naked eye uh, kind of uh, visibility. It was not a super bright star in the sky, but you could see it easily um, out in the country. And that process is, uh, here's the process that happens. You have two helium nuclei, one helium four nucleus, two protons, two neutrons, one helium three nucleus, two protons, one neutron, and they fuse together and they actually make beryllium, uh, which then decays fairly quickly uh, and becomes lithium-7. So this is the process that we get most of lithium from in uh, the solar system and in the rest of the universe as well. So how big is a lithium atom? I can only really compare it to a, uh, to a hydrogen atom for you. So here's on the left, the size of a hydrogen atom, and on the right, the size of a lithium atom. They're very small though. Notice the hydrogen atom is only about uh, a 10 billionth of a meter across. So it's very, very small. 10 to the minus 10th meters across, one angstrom unit. And lithium's about uh, four times that size. So it's a, big, it's a big atom compared to hydrogen, considering that it doesn't have that much more in it. It has, um, it's very low density, lithium. As a matter of fact, it um, only weighs half a gram per cubic centimeter. Half a gram, what's water? Water is one gram per cubic centimeter, which means that since it's less dense than water, if you dropped it into water, what would happen? It would float. Here you go. Here's the lithium floating. There it is. They just dropped it in. When it is dropped in water, it reacts fairly violently with the water, and making lithium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. So if you actually brought the torch down there next to that, it would actually make a be beautiful red flame with the hydrogen gas burning very hot and the lithium hydroxide in there. Um, in the crust of the earth, you have more than one in eight million atoms because the crust of the earth is more concentrated. It's the heavy stuff that you get in the universe. So in the crust of the earth, if you look here, you can see that for instance, for every um, atom of, uh, of lithium, which is on the very, uh, uh, I can't point with my pointer on this, on this screen, but it's on the very left-hand side there, lithium. For every atom of that, there's about uh, a thousand atoms of, uh, of oxygen and silicon. So it's, it's, there's a lot of it in the earth, but it's not a super, amount, much less than the rare metals down below, the gold and platinum and rhodium and, and iridium and osmium, those the heavy metals. Um, there's a lot of lithium in the world, but it is a limited resource. Um, you can see here, these are in uh, metric tons. The United States, uh, I love the fact the United States in 2013 produced 870 metric tons of lithium, but in 2014, they withheld the amount. I don't know why. It must be terrorists, because that's the only thing I can ever think of. But you can see that the United States does not produce a lot of uh, lithium. Uh, most of it is produced in uh, other countries, uh, with uh, Australia producing a, a large amount and Chile producing a large amount as well. Um, and uh, so we are pretty dependent uh, on other countries. What are its usages? Um, here you can see that uh, lithium is used for a lot of different things. Most of it is used in the making of glass and ceramics. 
about a third of it. About another third of it is used in batteries. We're all familiar with lithium batteries. We'll get to that a little bit more. Uh, and uh, then the smaller amounts for things like lubrication and casting and uh, air. Remember I said that it was used in uh, air treatment? It, you can absorb water. It's a, it's a really good uh, water absorbing thing. So you can use it for air treatment to absorb water. Um, and of course, a few other uses in there as well. One of those uses um, that you may not know about is that lithium is actually used in grease. Grease is really um, just a combination. Here's a lithium grease. You want to see what lithium grease looks like? Let's see if I can squeeze some out here for you. Jim can probably get this on the camera. This is lithium. This is white lithium grease. It's a little bit different than the one you, you see in the, ugh, it's disgusting. Sure, we can pass this around, it's non-toxic. Let me put a little more on here. Should pass napkins around too if we're gonna do that. So that's lithium grease. and. Uh, as, as I mentioned, grease is really a combination of oil and soap. And you make soap out of basic stuff, sodium, uh, and, but you can make it out of lithium. Lithium has a higher melting point, so it's, it's good for grease. So you'll find this stuff in your car. This is what you might lubricate your car with. All of our seawater systems, it's very resistant to uh, seawater and uh, it's used in our seawater treatment system. I hope everybody has had a chance to take a look at that. You're being heated and cooled here by, by the bay. So lithium grease is made from lithium soap, and I don't think they make that for washing your hands, but, uh, but it's, uh, it also sticks well to metal, so uh, it's also a good thing for, uh, for uh, doing lubrication in cars and, and motors. Uh, my favorite picture, uh, with lithium grease, I have to get, this is, I just had to use this, was this picture of Kim Jong-un <laughs> Who is, at the, who is giving field guidance to the Chongji grease factory here. I wish I got this much joy out of lithium grease, actually. But uh, there you go. It's a classic picture. It's become a meme on the internet. Lithium has been used, uh, or was used, actually, in something that you're familiar with. It was originally used in 7-Up. 7-Up was a lithiated soda. It's no longer... Uh, has lithium in it. No, no more lithium in 7-Up. Um, they stopped doing that quite a number of years ago, just like they stopped putting coca in Coca-Cola uh, quite a while ago as well. Um, I mentioned already batteries. Batteries is one of the major uses of lithium. Uh, these batteries have a very high energy density. You, can get, you get a lot of bang for your kilogram in lithium batteries because lithium is so light. It's such a, it's such a, a light element that uh, these batteries hardly weigh anything. As a matter of fact, I have lithium batteries in my car. Um, I have one of those cars, not the Tesla, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and I have a big lithium battery that goes down the center tunnel of my, of my car and is underneath the back seat. So that, keep, that lets me drive for about 40 miles uh, on batteries only, very cool. Um, lithium was also used, and I think we mentioned this slight, uh, uh, a little bit, in the H-bomb. Lithium was an important ingredient in the H-bomb, and it's, I'm gonna walk over to, can I walk over to the monitor? I'm gonna just walk over to the monitor and point because it's hard to see. There's a lithium-6 deuteride, so lithium hydride, this outer shell right here, the inside is a pencil of the spark plug of plutonium, and that uh, the, is what was responsible for providing the hydrogen in the hydrogen bomb. Uh, there's a standard fusion bomb at the top there that kind of causes, compresses, and heats the bottom, that pencil. And uh, that gives you the hydrogen bomb. The, one of the first hydrogen bombs was uh, this Castle Bravo test, um, which was carried out on the Bikini Atoll. Ooh, good sub base. Um, this bomb here was the first time they'd used the lithium hydride, lithium deuteride, really, uh, in the hydrogen bomb. And uh, uh, this was supposed to be a five megaton explosion. It turned out to be a 15 megaton explosion. It was three times as powerful as they expected it to be, not what you want to have. Um, and that was because they didn't quite 
know the reactions that were happening with the lithium and the, because uh, the lithium turned into uh, tritium and that provided more explosive, more fusible material. So this uh, test was uh, dramatic to say the least and the music always helps. I'm sure they were playing this Carmina Burana style music during the test. It was, uh, it was such a large explosion. Here's where it actually happened. Uh, if you haven't gone to Google Earth and looked where Bikini Atoll is, I thought it was really cool. You can actually see, if we go in here, there's Bikini Atoll. And if you go in a little further on Bikini Atoll, you can see where the actual Castle Bravo test occurred because it left this giant crater on the shore of the, uh, of the uh, atoll as well. Yeah. So, um, another really exciting place that I think there were fire where uh, uh, the uh, lithium is used is in fireworks. Uh, I showed you this beautiful red flame. Well, in fireworks, uh, in a moment you'll see some of the some red ones. That I, this was uh, the fireworks down here, actually, in 2000. There you go. There is the lithium red that was taken in uh, uh, during our Fourth of July celebration in 2013. Here, there's the red. Look at those beautiful lithium reds. Yeah. There's some heart-shaped ones that are going to go off. There's a heart-shaped one. I love fireworks. By the way, this is what one of those shells looks like. This is a, an inert, don't worry, there's no gunpowder here. Um, this is an inert shell. Those things that you send up into the sky actually look like this. They're actually blown into the sky. They don't rocket into the sky. And if you want to know how these things work, full spectrum science in June, we will do fireworks. So. I could show you what was in, it, what, what's inside here, but I'm not going to. You have to come to full spectrum science. But there are whole books on the chemistry of pyrotechnics that tell you about the color of flames and the, what kind of things you add to fireworks to make them various colors. There are actually journals that you can subscribe to. And <laughs> it's amazing. One of the last applications I really want to talk about here is Pharmaceutical lithium. Pharmaceutical lithium is uh, used to treat uh, manic uh, episodes for bipolar disorder. Um, also, sometimes depression, schizophrenia, and uh, uh, when you have a hard time controlling your impulses, uh, lithium may uh, help treat those problems as well. But I'm going to stop right here because our next guest, um, Julie Anderson, uh, Dr. Julie Anderson is going to talk more about the pharmaceutical uses of lithium. So uh, we'll take a quick break here and we'll come back uh, in about two minutes and we'll have Dr. Anderson.